Swanee. It's good to uh, it's good to be talking to you again. Or uh, it would be Colonel Swanee if I was still serving. But I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna take that liberty and call you Swanee if that's all right, sir. That's perfectly fine, Hugh. It's good to see you again. <laughs> it's good to see you. Good to see you. Let's um, I'm gonna roll straight into it. CO3 power currently. Out of all your out of all your career or anything else you've been doing or do. What's your most memorable leadership position and why? Right, that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a tough one because, you know, as you know, in the army, we, we kind of bounce, we bounce around a lot. Um, like all of us tend to get moved fairly often and we command or lead different sort of teams of things. So it's a tough one. And, and, you know, I've, I've bounced around in my 20 sort of years in, in, as an officer in the army, um, I spent about about 12 of them commanding paratroopers and about 15 of them in, in one of the para battalions or at the depot. So, and, and you know, even when we're in, before I even talk about the ones that I think probably stand out, even when, uh, even when we're in sort of staff job, officers sometimes have leadership positions. So, you know, I, I've had a few of those that have, that have tested leadership in a, in a memorable way. But like two examples, when I was in Joint Force Headquarters, one of the jobs that we did was going out to to embassies around the world to help them develop crisis management plans. And I remember as a kind of, that's the, that's the first job I did outside of para battalion, by the way, or, or, or the depot. So I find myself as a young major in, you know, in, a, in an embassy somewhere in the Middle East and, and working with essentially you know, civilians, locally employed civilians, foreign office workers, some really punchy people. But leading them is, or, or being involved in, in you know, in, in decision making with a group like that is really different to, to doing it in a para battalion with a bunch of paratroopers, as you can imagine. So you kind of find yourself doing different things. And and then, and in, you know, in some ways I was leading, leading them because they look to you as a military f person in a crisis to kind of, you provide a bit of guidance, I suppose, a bit of, a bit of stability on where to go, the direction to go. So it was, so there's like jobs where outside of traditional leadership commanding soldiers bit that, that you do that's challenging, which is quite, which is quite interesting. I think, though, that there's probably the the ones that stick out for me would be my, my first one. Because, you know, I've, as I say, like 15 years in the para battalion, maybe kind of, I think 12 of them have been in command of paratroopers. And um, and every one of them has been an absolute privilege. But, but the ones that stick out would be always the first one. I, I made this point when, when you recognise this, Hugh, because you used to beast me for it, I'm sure, as well. But I made this point when I first turned up in a para battalion. I sort of said to you know, to, to the officers, my fellow officers, you know, remember that soldiers sort of look at the route that we take into the army with 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 distaste in many ways because they've been through depot. Para red soldiers have been through 26 weeks of horrible pain to, to wear that cap badge, to wear our cap badge, our bearing. As an officer, we do the same course as everyone else in the band, and we just have an interview. It's a tough interview and you've got to perform well at Sanders, but at the end of the day, it's the same course. That that qualifies us to be an army officer. We then go off and do the platoon commander's battle course, which teaches us to be an infantry officer. And then we do P Company, which which qualifies us to be an airborne officer. But none of those things, none of those things give you the right to wear that beret, really, because they're the same as everyone else. What gives you the right, I think, what teaches you to be a parachute regiment officer is when you spend time with paratroopers. And so I learned more from from Martin Johnson and Emlyn Hughes and Neil Northcott and, you know, Gaz Marshall and Dean Kurgan and Zip Lane. My first section commanders and platoon sergeants, and obviously Mick Bolton and Steve Tidmarsh, my first two platoon sergeants, they taught me more about being a regular than, and about being an officer, full stop, than anything I had learned before that. So I think, and, and so in many ways, it's their fault that I am the way I am. But um, but I think that, I think all of us need to kind of, you know, we all probably look back at our first role, either either fondly or or um, or, or, or ho with horror in some cases, I think, if, if it went badly. Um, but we all learned a lot from it, so it's probably the most memorable. And the second yeah. one, sorry, the, yeah, that's that. That's probably the one that sticks in the most. That's the one I talk about the most because you know I speak to young officers a lot and I speak to paratroopers a lot and I tell them that that, that they should be shaping and moulding the future of the regiment um, in many ways. The second one is more of a time. It's not really a leadership position. It's just a. It's I came back from the depot in two thousand and four to 
to D Company to work with you in I was patrols when you were snipers and and uh, and this period begins then and it ends when I left three power again six years later to go back up to to the depot to command P Company and it's not a, I did several jobs patrol platoon commander air ops I commanded D Company I was the ops officer the operations officer for, for a couple of and we did two tours together I just look back as that that was the most professionally rewarding time of my career I think um and it just it, it kind of i don't obviously we always look back with rotating glasses don't we but i think because of the tours and because of um maybe because of my seniority because i knew the battalion really well i wasn't new to it it kind of felt like a family and, and my sort of fellow officers around but you you know people used to call us the captain's revolutionary command council didn't they um and a group, little tight knit of, of of guys commanding the patrols or, or the machine guns or any tanks all then becoming the air ops officers and ops officers and adjutants and stuff and we were just we were just thick as thieves and we were thick as thieves with you guys as well you know the corporals and the senior NCOs in the battalion we were just three power was an incredibly close-knit unit also inclusive people who work with us wanted to work with us and, and, and loved working with us but but good lord that was a that was a great time to be in be in the army be in the reg and particularly to be in three power sweet spot the ops wasn't it going back to your first role as platoon commander I can imagine it being memorable with uh, with the flipping personalities of Mick Bolton and Steve Tidmarsh. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, they are strong characters indeed, right? And that's it's, it's an odd thing that that was uh, it was it was an odd experience for me actually. On the flip side, when I became a platoon sergeant, that experience of being paired up yeah. essentially with another commander who's got much less experience than I have, but then also. A lot of knowledge that I didn't have, so it was an officer, you know, like, like when you were to commander, a really weird thing, very unique to the that military, that kind of two two commanders paired together, the junior one is going to is going to run the show, and <laughs> it's very very strange, but it works, it works really well. On on that, thinking back, what's what's your most memorable mistake or your most significant mistake that you've made, and how did you overcome it? How did you deal with it? um so you know you mentioned this to me before and i i, I spent a lot of time thinking about this <laughs> because for, for many well like, there's a whole number of factors where i spent a lot of time thinking firstly i've made loads like like embarrassingly loads <laughs> so many how i'm here just extraordinary but um but i suppose i suppose making the mistakes is not is not the the thing to focus on it's how you approach them you know, I look back and I say, oh, I should have taken more risk then, or I should have taken less risk then, or I should have, I should have made that decision, or I should have with this uh, advice. You know, whatever it is, it, it's a balance. You know, some, sometimes you just got to make a decision. Um, and I don't, you know, this isn't about regret. This isn't about looking back things with regret. This is about if you make a mistake, how you respond to it, like learning from it. And I think, um, and I think that experience is what makes. I think it's a great thing about the the army in many ways uh, is that we don't um, yeah you know, we kind of allow room for error. Clearly, there are some errors that, that you, you, we shouldn't we will never accept. But in training, we kind of encourage failure. So the, the, the phrase we use now is it's safe to fail. But we, so we always want people to to work to failure so that they actually learn from it because it's the, it is the best way to learn. And I think the you know how you respond to it is is what I think is what underpins your character and, and on fundamentally I think good leaders, the people who have, I've always been particularly impressed by, the people who have, you know, they've either they've, things have gone wrong and they've dealt with it in a really impressive way. Or or similarly, they've had massive successes and it hasn't gone to their head. You know, they've they've just always been you know, they've always learned and they've always taken the good and the bad from every situation. I think the the, the mistake and accountability are two two things that, that I thought about a lot when I see them. So rather than kind of listing the other mistakes, because as I say, there there is a multitude of them. Um, the things the things that I felt accountable for that have stuck with me the most, that had the most impact. And I think I think that you know that as a as, a, as an army officer, particularly of my generation, who sort of did tours, you know, we we served together in Afghanistan a couple of times. Yeah, it would be no surprise that any anything where where it's one of our soldiers, one of our family, like I talked about earlier, got injured, would be the ones that I that hit me the hardest, and the ones that I've kind of dwelled on, I guess, over the years in many ways. Um, and you know, you all recognise this, mate. So, 
the the thing I felt most accountable for is probably the incident at Kajaki when we lost Mark Wright and when when Stu uh, Stu Pearson lost their legs. Um, and that you know that, that wasn't because I personally did anything wrong. We we all unfortunately had to go through a coroner's inquiry to to to, to prove that. And we knew, you know, I knew in my heart, apart from anything wrong. But I was in the headquarters when those decisions were made. I was the air operations officer, you know. Um, and and I just, I, I sometimes still come, go back to being in that in that position, in that headquarters, where we were all desperately trying to make the right decisions for people who were hundreds of miles away in, in the most terrifying circumstances. And, uh, and you know, that, that, still, that, still gets, that still gets to me sometimes. Um, it's a difficult thing to overcome. How, how do I overcome its impact? I think, again, it's about learning from from it. It's about how, you know, I, I look back now and I, I think what I've managed to do is rather than it being something that has hindered me, I think it's something that now motivates me to make sure that people aren't afraid to to challenge. People aren't afraid to make decisions. And, um, yeah, and fundamentally, you know, we're, we're all good people. And I, and I, I know I always ask all, all the leaders to something I'll talk about you know, several times is, is trying to just be a good person and make decisions based on what you know is to what you know to be right rather than what you think is, is going to make you look good or whatever. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that Kajaki incident was a flipping nightmare. Uh, as were many, 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 many incidents that occurred mate, on those ops. Mm. Um, and looking back with the benefit of hindsight, well, that's great. But you, you know, you make decisions based on what's gone on, on in the situation on the day, and uh, that was a crazy day. I mean, um, the, the next question is about morale. Um, <laughs> morale was at a morale was at a low ebb for a lot of people uh, after that day. Um, but no, in a, maintenance of morale as as one of the the principles of war. When when was the morale of your soldiers in whichever role you're in at its lowest ebb and and how did you manage the situation how did you get them back to a position um where it was a a, a, a risk-free level if you like of of morale so i i don't think there's they i'd love to be able to give you a story of, of when you know we were everything was on a low ebb and and there was this galvanizing moment where everybody's everybody's morale turned around. But, you know, the, the reality of the reality of the army and any organization is that we're not we're not automatons. And, you know, much as a lot of people externally will look into the army and they'll say, well, you're all robots and you will just, you know, you will feel the same emotions similarly. I mean, that's that's just fundamentally not true um, because everybody is a, is a free thinking, you know, free willed individual. And some people will be affected by by situations and incidents and environments in a very different way to others and so I think the um I, so I found it really hard to sort of identify when you know my morale has when sorry when when I've, I've perceived morale to be low but actually it's been my morale that's been low and not not everybody around so it's really hard for me to identify a kind of moment where you know morale has been so low and I think so sort of talking back to that team of, of, of all different people, we've all been on courses, we, you know, and, and let's be honest, you know, you, you, you'll have prided yourself on it if you haven't smashed the courses. You will have got a, um, a pick up when you saw somebody else starting to hang out. So when in Brits, you probably felt a little bit better because, you know, they were struggling on a march or they were colder and wetter than you were. Um, and in some, and I'm not saying morale, if someone's feeling low, other people feel high. What I'm saying is that, that as a team, when you belong to a team, not when you're in a course and there's other people struggling, but when you're in a team like like the family that, that, that I felt part of in the past and, and, and in many ways like the family I feel part of now, you, you've, got, you've got to kind of bounce off each other. And where an element of the team is really low because of a loss or a black moment or a, you know, just tough times, then you've got to look to the people who aren't struggling as hard to, to pick them up again. And it's one of the biggest things I've noticed since I've come back is that the tendency to medicalize quickly um, issues of, of um, you know, sometimes I say mental health, um, but, but, you know, someone's feeling a bit low. I, I sort of speak to him officer or, or a sergeant. So, you know, what are we doing about someone who's feeling a bit low? And, you know, a year ago when I first did come back to the battalion, 
the response was often involved when they were going to see the doctor or when they were going to go to see their medical health specialist. And I, you know, they know who, who's the, who are their mates? Who's going to be in the block with them over the weekend? Or who is it that lives next door to them on the patch? Who, who, who is it that's going to put their arm around them and help them here? Who, who is it? And you know what? It's, you know, it's great when people start seeing it that way. And so it was easy for some of the, the, the more experienced officers to get that. And I think now they kind of, the arm goes around people a lot more. And, and that, used to happen when we weren't when we didn't have phones when we were away all the time you could get in blues if you see someone got a dear john blue and he was low you know within minutes arms would be around that guy and sisters would have been offered up and you know the girls that you knew back in town and blah 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 so so, so in, that is probably the most probably crass but uh but tangible sort of way of seeing the the uh the key principle of war as you pointed out being maintained uh morale i think the the to give you a kind of example where we are at the moment, I wouldn't say morale in three parrot is low, right? But there are challenges. And I don't know whether that's felt everywhere in the battalion or if it's just being felt by me and my perception of it, because it feels really busy right now, like, like really busy. But, but, but I was up visiting a couple of the companies in, in you know, Thetford who are doing some crucial training that you know, we have to continue doing at the moment. Despite current environment, we are at high readiness. So, so we're doing some of the crucial training. And, um, and the morale was so high. The soldiers were back. They weren't locked down. They were adhering to social distancing and they were, they were all these sort of very strange, you don't say close in anymore because you can't at the moment, you have to stay distant. But there were, there were guys there who, who were really thrilled to be back amongst their team and, and not locked down. Um, and that's, that for me is, so that, that's reversed slightly my, my perception of, of guys being uh, perhaps at a slightly low ebb because of you know, less operational opportunities and much more exercises to do and things. Um, yeah, it's interesting how even in the civilian world where how different teams and different, yeah, different teams and different sort of subunits of part of the same big machine can be so completely different in terms of, I mean, just looking at one aspect, morale, for example, you know, can be so completely different in, in where they're at generally yeah. and and i find that's almost entirely down it's almost entirely down regardless of what they think of the of the you know the plan or the leadership overall how their levels of morale and how they deal with that it's almost entirely down with the personalities that they're immediately surrounded by you yeah. know as well as i do that if you get a team of and and you get someone who's you know senior or influential in that group and he's and he or she is also a flipping whinging git, constant morale hoover. You can bet your bottom dollar that that whole unit, subunit, is going to be is going to be feeling le- not feeling their morale is going to be less than what less than what it is elsewhere, less than what it should be. You get a, I mean, you go back to Steve Tidmarsh and Mick Bolton, strong characters, man, and you don't want to cross them, but sure. also. Their humour, their sense of humour is faultless. Do you know what I mean? So sharp. And yeah. and they could, you know, they can hammer your morale <laughs> when they need to, you know, with, with a bit of disciplinary stuff. But they can also put it put it through the roof. They can get people going. And they're not the only two people that you know and I know, but so many people like that. Very lucky. Exactly. So and the characters like that are what make people like me twenty years later look back at that with yeah, and say that, that was that they were great times. And that's that's one of the reasons why I try and say to people, I think there's a, don't tell anyone I said, uh, don't tell anyone I said this, but the Royal, one of the Royal Marines, of, I can't remember if it's one of their, kind of part of their ethos that says, you know, cheerfulness and adversary. That's a great line. That's a great, you know, being cheerful in the worst possible times. That kind of describes all, what we were talking about before, about the good, the good strong soldier the good strong paratrooper is the guy who, when it's raining and miserable and everyone's absolutely knackered, is cracking jokes and is getting people up and, and you know out and ready to go. And and that's the person who, when there's dark times out there, which invariably there have been, you know, and and there may be in the future for some some of our people. Those are the people that will make sure that we as a fighting force continue to be, you know, ready ready to do what we need to do. And that that's um, I think that's that's, that's really important. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
what um we've we've mentioned then there um a few good memorable leaders for various reasons what's the most what's the most important quality in a successful leader so um well, this is an interesting one because we, we've been talking about uh, lead, we talk about leadership a lot in, in the army, and I think that's really good and healthy. We don't talk about followership very much, and um, and and I I am increasingly of the view that that successful people or leaders are are as good as at following as they are at leading. If you, if you know what I mean, I think, and it, it's really hard for me to articulate why I why I've increasingly thought this. I think it's I think it's because as much as you you care about the people that you're you're leading and you should you should fundamentally care about them um, care deeply but you should also care about the people that you're following too and if if everybody is doing that if everybody has that relationship with those they they lead and those they follow then as an organisation you know we're kind of we're 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 much more cohesive you know the, the the mission command which underpins the British Army kind of way of thinking. Uh, has has several principles one of them is is trust and you know trust in in each other up and down is is crucial you know i'd rather i learned probably too late as a very young officer that um you know and uh, talking about mistakes you know the first mistakes i made were, were were mixing up the the importance of being liked versus versus being trusted you know trying to be too trying to be trying to win friends rather than actually you know win trust of of uh of those you you have the privilege of leading. I think it's a mistake so many of you have made, and I think they'll continue to make it. Um, but but fundamentally, you know, you make that mistake quickly, learn from it, and then you know the the, the people around you generally, the Mick Bond, the Steve Pidmarshes of the world, they'll 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 forgive you it, and, and they'll probably get you back on the straight and narrow pretty quickly. But um, trust is is really important. So what I mean by that right now, so. I, I really need three parents to trust me as the CEO. That trust that a I'm a good I'm a good bloke, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and b I'm making decisions based on you know that that is always 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 underpinned by the the, the deep sort of uh, desire I have to care for them and make sure they are safe. But at the same time, achieve the mission because as much as I want to keep every soldier safe, at the same time we have a job. We are in the army to do a job. Um, so they need to trust me, and, I, and it's really hard for me to do that because this is the first job I've had in in the parachute regiment where I don't speak to the soldiers every day. You know, I'm sat in an office, and people keep the soldiers away from me because I'm too busy. Um, that's quite that's quite hard. Um, so I have to you know, rely, I rely on fantastic company commanders, company sergeant majors, young officers, and sergeants to do that for me. Um, and I need them to trust me because when I make a decision, I just need everyone to get behind me. And, and, and get on with it and they will have they will be having the same thing with their their command you know the junior CEOs and the soldiers and, and right down to section level and in, in, a, in a very similar fashion I, you know I need to as well as I need them to trust me I've got to trust them a bit so I'm not meddling in every decision that uh, they're making and I need to kind of say to them this is broadly what I want you to achieve how you achieve it is up to you and uh because trust is, is is fundamental, you know. And if, if we don't do that, if it's not good, if it's trust isn't going both ways, as a follower and as a leader, then I think as an organisation there are just obstacles that will stop you being able to really, you know, move forward. Um, so that's the first, probably the, the first most important quality. And I think the second quality is, is, is the one that you know I kind of I've always lived by, and and, and that's just trying to be a good a good person, you know, just. Just making uh, decisions based, as I say, not on, not necessarily on what I want other people to think of me or, or my career or anything like that, but make decisions that I know are, are you know, the right ones that, 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 you know, that look out for the people I'm looking after generally, um, or just right, you know, the, the hard right way over the easy wrong way, and sometimes that that means you're not, you may not be perceived to be looking after people, and the discipline is one of the classic examples of a commander, especially a CEO of three power have to. Um, Occasionally, you know, be be perceived as being a bit harsh on people, but fundamentally, it's because you know it's the right decision to do. You can't you can't overlook a, a mistake, a, a failing. You have to deal with it, and that's the morally right thing to do. But at the same time, it's also again making decisions not because you want to 
you want to you know win uh plaud this from anywhere or, or you want to attract attention to people you make a decision because you know it's right for the battalion that's particularly hard for when you talk talking about organizations organizational change the greek proverb that a good mate of mine talked about recently and that's you know societies and i paraphrase society to succeed when when old men plant trees that they won't ever get to sit under the shade of and you know sometimes when you're making decisions and the really tough leadership decisions you make sometimes aren't on operation they're actually they're actually here because it's they're in camp because it's, it's hard commanding paratroopers who aren't on operation because they, they you know they there's a number of other things that you're dealing with um in that way operation is fairly easy but when you're when you're making those decisions here about the organization about someone's career about the culture of the battalion about about you know the way you want the army or society to perceive the regiment i think you're trying to make decisions that will ultimately you'll see that you won't see the benefits of it. i won't see the benefits of the co group i'm hoping my successor will or, or his or her successor will in the future you know so that's the that's the the, the second thing i think really important to leader people who make make decisions for the right reason not for necessarily their their, their own, own reason being a good bloke makes perfect sense <laughs> colonel swan it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and catching up again after all these years good to see you Hugh. yeah well done mate I, thanks pleasure listening to some of these podcasts no good um well done to you mate for, for everything you've, you've achieved in your career so far and uh, i hope you Hope you continue to go up the ranks um, and I will catch you in Colchester sooner rather than later for a beer, hopefully. I look forward to it, mate. Stay safe. Good luck. Okay, thanks.